Good morning. As your bell ringer for today, I'd like you to complete two different tasks. In your warm-up notebook, I would like you to please list three real-world situations that might use the Pythagorean theorem. Um, you might want to think about distance, um, how large something is. Those might be some good starting points. Then, I want you to take one of your situations and sketch a diagram that explains where in this situation the Pythagorean theorem works. You may collaborate with your table partner quietly, um, and after about three minutes, I'm going to ask for some ideas. Um, so you may volunteer to share your ideas then. For the last few days, we have worked with a piece of geometry that is called the Pythagorean Theorem. Who can share with me what the Pythagorean Theorem is? Who would like to share that with us? Yes. The Pythagorean Theorem is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Now, I bet you're thinking, who's this Pythagoras guy? Why does this even matter to me? I found on YouTube this awesome video called What's Up with Pythagoras. I want to show it to you today. Um, the girl shares a lot of information. However, all of that information uh, is not going to be covered. But I really liked her illustrations and the humor in this video. So let's just watch this about eight minute video now. Okay, so I've been learning about Pythagoras, and the dirt on him is just too good. You've probably heard of the Pythagorean Theorem, but not the part where Pythagoras was a crazy cult leader who thought he'd made a deal with a god thousands of years ago and could remember all of his past lives. Oh, and he killed a guy. I mean, maybe it was a long time ago. And he was afraid of beans. As in beans, they just, like, freaked him out or something, I don't know. But mostly I want to talk about the murdery part. See, Pythagoras and his cult of Pythagoreans had this cool kids club where they'd talk about proportions all day. They'd be like, hey, I drew a two by three rectangle using a straight edge and compass. Isn't that awesome? And then someone would be like, hey guys, I have a box that's two by three and a half. And the cool kids would be like, three and a half? That's not a number. Get out of our club. And then they'd make the units half the length and call it 4 by 7, and everything was okay. Even if your box is 2.718 by 6.28, you could just divide your units into thousandths, and you'd get a box that's a nice, even 2,718 by 6,280. It's not a simple proportion, but hey, the box still has a whole number of proportions, so Pythagoras is happy. Unless it's a box of beans, then he freaks out. I like to imagine what it would be like to think of numbers the way they did. Maybe you think of numbers as being on a line. Numbers one way, then zero and negative numbers the other, and there are numbers between the numbers, fractions, irrationals, filling in the gaps. But Pythagoras didn't think about numbers like this at all. They weren't points in a continuum, they were each their own separate being. Which is still pretty modern, because before that, people only thought of numbers as adjectives. Numbers of. In Pythagoras' world, there is no number between 7 and 8, and there isn't a number 3 over 2 so much as a relationship between 3 and 2, a proportion. 6 to 4 has the same relationship, because the numbers share this evenness, which, when accounted for, makes it 3 to 2. The universe, to Pythagoras, was made up of these relationships. Mathematics wasn't numbers. Mathematics was between the numbers. But while people admire how much Pythagoras loved proportions, there's a dark flip side to that obsession. How far was he willing to go to protect the proportions he loved? Would he kill for them? Would he die for them? And the answer was he'd go pretty far until beans got involved. It's time for timeline time. Mathematicians like lines. I want the context, because in school today, if you bring out the ruler and compass and are like, let's do some geometry, let's draw two lines at 90 degree angles using a straight edge and compass, here's a happy square. Then you've probably had years of math class already and think of geometry as being harder than adding big numbers together. You probably think that zero is a simple easy concept and have heard of decimals too. Well. Here's now, 2012. Here's Einstein, Euler, Newton, and da Vinci. That sure was a while ago. Now let's go all the way back to when Arabic numerals were invented and brought to the West by Fibonacci. Before that, arithmetic was nightmarishly hard, so if you can multiply multi-digit numbers together, you can go back in time and impress the beans out of Pythagoras. And before that, there was no concept of zero, except in India, where zero was discovered around here. And if you keep going back, you get to year one. There's no year zero, of course, because zero hadn't been invented. And back a bit more, you get to folk like Aristotle, Euclid, Archimedes, and then finally, 
Pythagoras all the way back in 6th century BCE. Point is, you can do some pretty cool mathematics without having a good handle on arithmetic, and people did for a long time. And in school, when they tell you you need to memorize your multiplication table and graph a parabola before you can learn real mathematics, they are lying to you. In Pythagoras' time, there were no variables, no equations or formulas like we see today. Pythagoras' theorem wasn't a squared plus b squared equals c squared, it was the squares of the legs of a right triangle have the same area as the square of a hypotenuse. All written out, and when he said square, he meant square. One leg's square, plus the other leg's square equals hypotenuse's square. Three literally squared plus four made it into a square. Those two squares have the same area as a five by five square. You can cut out the nine squares here and the sixteen here and fit them together where these twenty-five squares are, and in the same way, you can cut out the twenty-five hypotenuse squares and fit them into the two leg squares. Pythagoras thought you could do this trick with any right triangle. That was just a matter of figuring out how many pieces to cut each side into. There was a relationship between the length of one side and the length of another, and he wanted to find it on this map. But the trouble began with the simplest right triangle, one where both the legs are the same length, one where both leg squares are equal. If the legs are both 1, then the hypotenuse is something that, when squared, gives 2. So what's the square root of 2, and how do we make it into a whole number ratio? Square root 2 is very close to 1.4, which would be a whole number ratio of 10 to 14, but 10 squared plus 10 squared is definitely not 14 squared, and a ratio of 1,000 to 1,414 is even closer, and a ratio of 100 million to 141 million 421,356 is very close indeed, but still not exact, so what is it? Pythagoras wanted to find the perfect ratio he knew must exist, but meanwhile, someone from his very own Pythagorean brotherhood proved there was no ratio. The square root of 2 was irrational. That in decimal notation, once decimal notation was invented, the digits go on forever. Usually, this proof is given algebraically, something like this, which is pretty simple and beautiful if you know algebra, but the Pythagoreans didn't. So I'd like to imagine how they thought of this proof. No algebra required. Okay, so Pythagoras is all like, there's totally a ratio, you can make this with whole numbers. And this guy's like, is not, is two, is not, is two. Fine, have it your way. So there's a whole number ratio in simplest form, where this square plus this square equals this square. Yeah, that's the Pythagorean theorem, I made it. Yeah, though for this triangle, you don't even need the full theorem. It's easy to see that it's the same area by cutting each part into four triangles. But I don't want to divide the squares up into triangles, I want unit squares. So you mean kind of like this, where this square is divided into units, and so is this one, and they all fit perfectly into this one, and vice versa, but not like like this. It almost works, but you start dividing the square evenly to fill up the two equal other squares, and you got this one odd one out. There's an odd number of squares to begin with, so you can't divide them evenly between the two squares. There's not even a right triangle, what's your point? Just that you know an odd number like 7 isn't going to be it, without even trying. An odd number times itself gives an odd number of squares. So whatever this number is, it can't be 7. It has to be even. Okay, so the hypotenuse is even, that's fine. So what if I prove the leg is even too? Then it's not in simplest form. Any ratio where both are even, you divide by two until you can't divide anymore because one of them is odd, and then that ratio is the best. I thought we assumed we were talking about the simplest form ratio. We are. If there's a ratio in simplest form, at least one of the numbers is odd, and since the hypotenuse has to literally be divisible by two, then the leg must be the odd one. So what if I proved the leg had to be even? You just proved it's not. It can't be both. Unless it doesn't exist. What you forget, Pythagoras, is that if this is the square, then the two sides are the same. Just as this is divisible right down the center, so too is it divisible the other way. And the number of squares on this side, which are the number of squares in just one leg, is an even number. And for a number of squares to be even, what does the number have to be, Pythagoras, oh my brother? If leg squared is even, then the leg is even, but it can't be even because it's already odd. Unless it doesn't exist. But if they're both even, you could divide both by 2 and start again. But this still has to be even, which means this still has to be even, which means you can divide it by 2 again, but then it has to be even, so everything is even forever, and you never find the perfect ratio of oh, beans. He had a vision, a beautiful vision of a world made up of relationships between numbers. If this wasn't a whole number ratio, then what was it? The Pythagorean still believed, wanted to believe, that irrationality was somehow false and the world was as they wanted it, so this proof stayed secret, until someone spilled the beans. According to some, it was all a guy named Hippasus, and Pythagoras threw him off a boat to drown him as punishment for ruining what had been perfect. Or maybe it was someone else who discovered it, or Hippasus, or someone else who was killed by the Pythagoreans long after Pythagoras was dead, or maybe they just got exiled, who knows. And how did Pythagoras die? According to one guy, some guys got mad because they didn't get into the cool kids club. So they set Pythagoras' house on fire, and Pythagoras was running away, and they were chasing him, but then he came upon a field, and not just any field, but a field of beans. And Pythagoras turned around to face his pursuers and proclaimed, Better to be slaughtered by enemies than to trample on beans. And he was. 
Others say he ran off and starved himself to death, or just got caught by his enemies because he ran around the bean field instead of through it, or who knows what happened. People claim Pythagoras didn't like beans because he thought they were bad for digestion, or gave you bad dreams, or reminded him of male genitalia, or because he didn't want a clubhouse full of flatulating mathematicians, or he just didn't like them metaphorically. He and his followers were or weren't vegetarians, did or didn't sacrifice animals, possibly were only allowed to eat certain colors of birds. I mean, he definitely had a lot of rules to follow, but just what they were and what they meant is lost to history. I'd like to give you a colorful story about exactly what happened with Pythagoras, but somehow that kind of truth doesn't last. What I do know is that the square root of 2 is irrational, that there's no way to have the length of a side of a square and of the square's diagonal both be whole numbers. Mathematical truth is truth that endures. This proof is just as good now as it was 2,500 years ago. I mean, it's awesome, and it shows that there's more to the world than whole numbers, and shame on the Pythagoreans who didn't have the beans to admit it. Okay, what did we learn about Pythagoras? Who can tell me something they learned through the video? Um, Joe, what did you learn? Yes, Pythagoras was scared of beans. Isn't that crazy? Who else can tell me something they learned? Uh, Larry, what did you learn? He was a mathematician. Good. Um, and Anne, what else did we learn? that he was a philosopher. Exactly. So now we've learned a little bit about the man Pythagoras, and we are going to now look at why the Pythagorean theorem works. This is something called the Pythagorean theorem proof. Now that we've learned about this guy Pythagoras, we are going to look at why his proof works. Why does taking the square of two sides of a right triangle equal the square of the third side? Let's pretend that we have this right triangle. It has one side that is three units and one side that is four units. But how long is the side that is called X? Pythagoras had not come around, we wouldn't know how long x is because it's not evenly counted. So we're going to have to look at this triangle in the way that that Pythagoras would look at the triangle. Joe, can you tell me what Pythagoras would do to solve the missing length of this triangle? That's right, Joe, um, Pythagoras is going to take both of the known sides and turn them into squares. So now I'm gonna follow Joe's suggestion. I'm going to take the side lengths of the, this triangle and turn them into squares. So the one on the bottom will be four units by four units. The one on the side will be three units by three units. Let me draw those squares for you now. So here we go. I now have in green outlined a three by three square, which comes out to a total of nine little squares. I also have outlined a four by four square, which comes out to 16 little squares. These two squares themselves do not tell me what the side length of x is. So I'm going to have to figure out what would happen if I squared that side of x. I would end up with a square that looks something like this. Now Larry, I know that I have done this on grid paper for us, so I could count how many squares are in that x squared area. How might I figure that out? if I didn't have this on grid paper. What formula would I use, Larry? That's right, I'd use the Pythagorean theorem. But I want to see how I can get these little squares, the nine green squares and the 16 orange squares, 
to match up and make the amount of space that is in the x squared red square. Let's see what we could do next. Now I know that these two squares are not going to fit in to make the same one square. So I'm going to color them in really quickly, cut them apart, and see what we can find out. My squares are going to look something like this now. No matter how I arrange those two filled in squares, they don't fit in that x squared box. So what could I do next? What do you think we could do, Anne? That's right, we are going to cut the little squares apart. Now I have all these little tiny squares. Can we make them fit into the square that is x by x? Let's see. Um, what if I put the green squares around the outside of the orange square? Let's see what happens now. Let's see, I'm putting the green squares around the orange square, and I come up with something that looks like this. Do you think that that is the same size as the x squared area on our original triangle? Move the triangle over um, near my squares, and I'm going to get something like this. Does it seem that the orange and the green squares make up about the same space, or exactly the same space, as that x squared side? It does! Excellent! So we found out that our friend Pythagoras was right. If you take the square of one side of a right triangle and the square of the other side, you will get a square that is the same. But Rose, I have a question. This is a square. This isn't the side length of a triangle. How do I use Pythagorean's proof to prove that this side length of x triangle is the same? What do you think we should do, Rosa? That's right, if we use the algebra of Pythagorean theorem, then we will find out that we need to take the square root of that square. So Ben, I'm still looking at these triangles right here. How long do you think that side of x is? How many of those colored in squares can we find along the line that is x? One, two, three, four, five. Five of them. Excellent. Could I conclude that the side length x is five units long? Okay, I'm going to give you about a minute to collaborate with your neighbor. I want you to think about a generic sentence we could write that will explain what we did, not just for this triangle, but for all right triangles. Take about a minute now to collaborate with your neighbor. Okay, now we're going to move from why the Pythagorean theorem works to how to write a geometry proof. Who in our class today thinks that they can share what a proof is? What is a proof? What is a proof? Okay, Liz, what do you think a proof is? Well, a proof is when somebody gives evidence for something for something. Um, who can think of an example for me? Jean, what's your example? When somebody tells you you have to prove it. Exactly. What else? What else is a proof? Lauren, what do you think a proof is? Really good. I like that. Um, a proof is when you have a sentence that shows you what you should do.
excellent. All have gotten really close. Those are all great definitions of what a proof is. However, in your warm-up notebook, I would like you to please write down this math definition of a proof. I would like you to write down that a proof is a written statement, that it uses logic and definitions, and that it shows why a geometric statement or an algebraic statement is true. So take a moment right now. Let's write this down in our notebooks. I'd like you now to take a moment, turn to your table partner, and collaborate with them. Make sure you both have the entire definition of what a proof is. Do that now. I heard some really awesome collaborations happening there. Good job getting down what the definition of a mathematical proof is. So now we're going to come up with one together. We're looking for the a sentence in our own words that's going to show us why the Pythagorean theorem works. So let's do some brainstorming together now. Great job! Our class proof now says, in a right triangle, you add the square of the two legs to equal the square of the third, the longer side. Make sure that you record this in your notebook now. Now that we have our class definition of the proof down, I would like you please to write down this proof. This is a proof that is written in that math language that we talk about quite often in here. What you should also write down in your notebook is this sentence. In a right triangle, the sum of the squares of both legs is equal to the square of the hypotenuse. This is the same thing as when we say that if you add the square of both, of both legs that equals the square of the third longer leg in the right triangle. We've just used our vocabulary words of sum, legs, and hypotenuse in this math language definition. So please make sure that you record this in your notebook now. Now we're going to take this sentence, these language arts sentences, and we are going to apply them to math. Let's first look at the original triangle we had. This original triangle had a side length that was three units and a side length that was four units. So if I put three and four into my Pythagorean theorem, I know that three squared plus 4 squared is going to equal c squared, or the square of that third side. Now I know that 3 squared is the same as 3 times 3, which is 9, and 4 squared is the same as 4 times 4, which is, that's right, 16. Now I have 9 plus 16 is equal to c squared, but I don't want c squared. I want to get c by itself. So 9 plus 16 is 25. That equals our c squared. What I'm going to do now, how do I get rid of a squared? Who can tell me how I get rid of the squared? Um, let's see. Uh, Larry, how do I get rid of a unit that is squared? That's right, I use the square root. 
So if I do the square root of c squared, I end up with c. And if I take the square root of 25, what do I end up with? The square root of 25, I end up with Vern. Five, exactly, awesome. So I know that in this triangle, the third side length is five units long. Nice job, you guys. Make sure you get this example in your notebook now. Now I'd like you to make sure you get this example down in your warm-up notebook. Go ahead and do that now. Now that we've done this with numbers, does it work with any right triangle? Let's say we start with this right triangle. Triangle shows us that we have one side that is five foot in length and the other side is 12 foot in length, but we still do not know the length of the hypotenuse or the longest side, the one that is directly across from our right angle. Can we use the Pythagorean theorem to find the length of this side? Yes, yes, I can use the Pythagorean theorem to solve for the missing side of this triangle. I see that I have one side that is 5 foot long and another side that is 12 foot long. Those two sides touch and they meet at the right angle, making them the legs of our triangle. So I'll take 5 and I'll put it in for A and 12 and I'll put it in for B. So I have 5 squared plus 12 squared is equal to C squared. So Mary, what would I do first? That's right, I'm going to use my order of operations and do the exponents first. 5 squared I know is 25. And let's see, Anne, what is 12 squared? That's right, 12 squared is 144. And equal to c squared, I keep my algebra with both sides of the equation. Now what happens when I add 144 and 25? I get 169 is equal to c squared. But there's no way that that hypotenuse is 169 feet long. That's right, I need to find the square root of 169. So I'll find the square root of 169. If I do something on the left, I have to do it on the right. So I find the square root of c squared. Those squared and square root cancel out. So on the right-hand side, I have c. On the left-hand side, the square root of 169, does anyone know? The square root of 169, Jean. That's right, 13. So I know that the third le side length in this triangle is 13 feet long. Awesome, our proof worked, Pythagoras worked. We can do this with any right triangle. That's amazing. Give yourselves a hand. Excellent job today. What questions do you have? How can we answer any questions you have or clear up any confusion? All right, let's come back together. I just want to go over our main points for today. The first thing we learned today was about Pythagoras. He was a man who was from ancient Greece. Um, he was a mathematician and a philosopher. And the video told us he is afraid of beans. We also used colored grid paper to prove Pythagorean theorem correct. We learned why his theorem works by cutting apart those squares 
in figuring out how they fit together on the hypotenuse or the longest side of the triangle. Finally, today we wrote a class proof of the Pythagorean theorem. We tested this proof against two different right triangles. Remember that our proof in our own words was in a right triangle. You add the square of two legs to equal the square of the hypotenuse. Well, we sure have learned a lot today. Today for your exit ticket, you are going to show me where you have written the class proof of the Pythagorean theorem in your warm-up notebook. Remember, I want you to have this sentence as well as an example jotted down with pictures and numbers. For tomorrow, when you come into class, you should be prepared to write out our class version of the Pythagorean theorem proof. You will also have to show me an example of the Pythagorean theorem. You will be able to use your warm-up notebook, so do not panic. It is open notes. We are just going to practice again tomorrow. Take just a moment now to collaborate with your table partner. Make sure you both have all the pieces of the proof written down.